I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, need to announce an executive session that attended by members of the board and council on February 7th to discuss real estate and personnel issues. Uh, now it's time to take public comment on non-agenda items. All right, so. I would like to thank the road crew and the supervisors for a wonderful job under terrible circumstances of getting the roads cleared. <laughs> thank you very much for letting the township road crew work on the state roads because the state hasn't shown up yet. So, thank okay, you. Thank you. You did a lot to make the roads safer. Okay, Sarah, I think That was going to be my fear here, but especially the business of clearing the state roads so that the electric trucks could get in because otherwise we'd be waiting for Penn Dock, so. Okay. And I'd like to extend that thanks to the police department because they were helping get neighbors into warm houses, people that were without electricity and stuff. So I'd say the whole township staff is to be thanked. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Francis Ellis. Um, I wonder if uh, we may even get a dress Chester County in opening some of our schools uh, in an emergency like this because on the news, uh, they were talking about warming centers and the people would go home to a cold house at night. And um, I know we, we just got back online today and we have small woods show, but there were a lot of people who didn't have access even to water because they didn't have generators. And I thought that maybe with your influence, we could open one of the local schools and have people stay there for the duration because I bet they have kitchens and they have generators. Um, they wouldn't have to go all the way to Westchester to have a warm place to stay at night. Okay. The, the local warming center was the uh, Lionville Middle School. Yes, then I think it was moved to Westchester. We uh, we didn't have our television on because our generator doesn't run our TV, so we only had our battery operated radio listening to KYW. So actually, the only news that, that we knew, because we couldn't use our computers, was what was on the radio. We just got uh, our, our energy back today, so we were kind of like really in the dark. But I know it, it and the thing is, the, the, this cold was so cold for such a long time, and I know that even with our little stove, that the rest of our house was cold, and when you get washed with cold water, you know, you're really cold. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, just when you were making your, your comments, I was thinking, what about the local fire company? They have a generator. But they have a lot of room. And yeah, that, that, that would be good. But see, our, our house overlooks Owen J. Roberts. Owen J. Roberts had lights on the whole time, so I assumed that they had generators. Yeah, the fire company has a generator. Okay, and, and that, that, that would be fine. That would be, you know, put, you know, put cots up, um, uh, soup, hot dogs, you know, any, anything to get people you know, out of a cold house, because no one ever anticipated, I don't think, that, that, that the outage would be this long, until Bob and I, one day, we decided to, you know, just take a look around and see what was going on in the township, and we went out to, to Birch Run Road, and once we got past Owies, I mean, it was like a horror movie. There were, the trees were down, the wires were on the road, and there were you know, wires hanging from the trees, and I thought, well, this is going to be, like, a long, long time. Um, so I was just you know, trying to think about you know other people in the township, that especially people who have people who are sick that they're, they're caring for, and um, just you know that we have things right in our neighborhood to offer them. And we don't have to go to Lionville or Westchester. Okay, thanks. Uh, Christy Martin was next. I'm sorry, um, sir. I just want to say there are people in this township that the police went and picked up. Yeah, they I called around and put them in homes and warmed them up. I mean, it was a Herculean effort. I was not aware of any of that. Was uh, I don't know why, but I mean, it's a Chester County emergency. You can call them. Not, you, if you have oh, a cell phone, we call 911. For the most part, and we were in the dark. I mean, I just got mine back on 15 minutes ago. Right. All I can say is every time I went out, the township was everywhere. But it really is a national emergency. You know, and, and, yeah, and there's another point. We'd be far back off the road. I don't want dirt on trees down my driveway. I know that. But I'm not even sure this is a, a, a township issue. I mean, to me, it's a county-wide emergency. It is a township issue. I'll tell you why. Well, well anyway, well, all I want to do is thank you for what you did, because uh, yeah. it was amazing. Uh, the, the damage that was done was like a, a, 
Okay. Well, I, I still think there's a pretty large portion of the township that doesn't have power yet. So. I'm sorry. I know, I know. I know. Yeah, as, as of the most recent report, there's a little over 400 people who still don't have power. Okay. So I'm sorry, so I don't know your name. My name is Pete Maniscalco. We live on Barrington Lane, um, a resident of the township for 10 years, very happy with the township, very happy with what was done by the township for the last storm, also two years ago in Sandy. But I think we get the short end of the stick. And I guess I have a question in finding out, what does the town do, if anything, to um, contact PICO? Because I think they are terrible. <laughs> um, two years ago, we had Sandy. We lost power for five days, just as we did now for five days. Barrington Lane seems to be the last block in our area off of Horseshoe Trail to get power back. In past storms, I and mean, we've lost power in the last 10 years, probably about, I'm going to guess, 15 or 16 times, sometimes two days, sometimes three days. Um, it's coming up Horseshoe Trail. Now, Pico, a few years back, did a nice job in trimming, and the power failure stopped for a couple of years. And then all of a sudden, it started again. I know someone that works with Pico, and they're saying that when they try to cut their budgets, the first thing they cut is the tree trimming. Uh, I came in here two years ago to complain about everybody else around us having lights, but we didn't. And I said, do you think someone from the township could call Pico? I don't remember who it was, but the fellow looked at me asking why. I mean, we had a storm. And my response was, I think the township would carry a little bit more weight than an individual call. So is there anything that goes on? I feel that we get in West Vincent Township, and maybe Chester County, the short end of the stick, when it comes to Pico. I lived in New Jersey for quite a few years. In an area similar to this, public service, I felt, was much, much reactive to storms than Pico is, for some reason. And I know if this was a very bad storm, and two years ago was a very bad storm, but as I said, this happens far too often in our community. And I guess I'd like to know, is there anything done in a concentrated effort, whether it's a public utilities commission or complaining to people or get somebody from Pico in this area? I think Jim has done a lot. At least I just had a report a half an hour ago, and there's, there's only limited things he can do with Pico. But as an alternative, there's a gentleman named Brian Costello, who's a county commissioner running for uh, Jim Gerlach's office, and he's been all over the internet trying to get in Pico's face and you might want to call him as a citizen because he's looking for votes and it would be a good time to get what somebody like that. Jim, um, <laughs> Brian, Brian Costello. Brian Costello. Okay. I have his phone number if you see me after the meeting I'll give it to you. I know New York had a uh, situation with the power company they were dealing with uh, during Sandy and uh, if you remember Long Island it took them months and months and months to get back. Well, the governor of the state threw them out and got public service from New Jersey to now handle that New York area. So I don't know if we have any clout like that, but um, the amount of money that Pico charges for electric, they sure as heck don't give the service to the customers. But the there, there is, like the young lady said before, it's a disaster out there. I, I have two large trees down on my road, fortunately. Mm -hmm. We still, we still got power somehow. It, it's amazing, but those trees are going to be removed. Can we put something in place from the township that if we're out for a day or two, that the utility commission is called on the part of the township for all the residents? The, Jim will be able to address it, but uh, when this started on Wednesday morning, by 8 o'clock Wednesday morning, I know there were conference calls with the county emergency management, PICO, our emergency man management coordinator, and Jim. One of the conference calls, there was three calls a day, I think. Was that right? Yeah, there were, well, there was uh, Chester County. There were two calls a day, and at 3 o'clock every day, there was a conference call with PICO. Uh, we were very active participants in that. Um, in terms of tree trimming, the answer is we have worked with PICO in the past on tree trimming. Uh, it is something that uh, they do when they have the money. It's correct that most, most utilities, and I used to work for a utility, but not PICO, uh, tree trimming is something that uh, gets trimmed from the budget uh, because right. it is something that is viewed as discretionary, but it certainly becomes a problem during storms. This storm here is really unusual uh, in that it is, a, a lot of the tree trimming would not have done much good because you had whole trees literally come out of the ground or split or whatever. This is, 
a lot of the, the damage you see in, in certain storms is because of, uh, of improper trimming or no trimming. Uh, this is not the case in this storm. This, this, this was so severe. Uh, uh, we had, uh, at, at the height of the storm, I think we had 19 roads that were closed. Uh, Chester County had over 700 roads that were closed. Uh, they are still working to restore service. Uh, we work when we can with PICO, but during these emergencies, we work primarily with Chester County. PICO has set up a mechanism, for, for example, on closed roads, we have to go through Chester County. We report in, uh, all the time to Chester County. Jim Gooding is here, he's an emergency management person. He's, he's been in direct contact with, with Chester County almost like on an hourly basis, reporting to them what roads are open, what roads are closed, any change of status. Because one of the things that happened, like on Wednesday, we would open a road, turn around, and the road would be closed down again because it was just that type of storm. I mean, things were coming down uh, on all the time. We had one hit a piece of township equipment to do damage to it. Uh, you know, it, it was a very serious situation. Being without electric for five days, I, I know, and, without a generator. Yeah, and and, and and I think my point is it's happening far, far too often. Well, if I can sort of address that, and this comes from the energy with the utility, one of the reasons that, that this is happening now more frequently is because we've entered deregulation of utilities. That is true in Pennsylvania, it's true in a lot of other states. It used to be with the utility that whenever a utility spent a dollar they would, at doing something, they'd make like six cents on the dollar. Right. Uh, that gave them a tremendous incentive to have reliability at what they call either four nines or five nines. So 0.9999 is four nines. So what has happened since deregulation is quite frankly, they don't have a lot of programs in place that they used to have, which were for reliability, uh, and it, it, the reliability has suffered. It suffered throughout Pennsylvania. It's not just Pico. It's a lot of the utilities, and it, and it is an increasing problem. Uh, it, it is not just Pico. Uh, At the same time, our rates haven't gone down. I, you know, it, that's a different issue. And, and uh, one thing I'll say is, if you call us or email the township, if you would like, there is uh, we have the complaint forms for the PUC. As a regulated utility, PICO is regulated by the PUC. You can file complaints with the PUC. I would recommend that you do that because, among other things, you know, it, it, this has been a very problem situation. It, it, it's been very difficult for a lot of people. And, uh, you know, Jim and I, we've been fairly close to the situation, and there's a lot of things that we need to do in terms of getting information that once this is all over, back to PICO. And things that either didn't happen, shouldn't have happened, uh, or could have happened. Uh, when we're talking with PICO, uh, we raise a lot of issues, and one of the issues is uh, their outage uh, system and, and the fact that they're telling people when they're going to be, uh, when they're going to have their power back. I mean, I've been personally told that our power is going to be back Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, right. Monday night, and now Tuesday night. Uh, and, and of course, what that means is you reach a, a, a point where you, they don't have any credibility. I will tell you that we work very closely with the county. I will tell you also today, uh, I personally went to the PICO Customer Care Center with Becky Corbin, who's our state representative, and met with people there. Uh, we've been in contact with the uh, uh, local PICO municipal representative, but I will tell you that one of the things that, that we've observed is breakdowns in communication within PICO. Uh, and things that we were told uh, by certain people either didn't happen or things like that. One last thing. Two years ago, we had lost power for five days. Mm -hmm. I came into the township, asked someone to call, and they did, in fact, call. Mm -hmm. And whether it was a coincidence or not, but within three hours, they had a truck on the corner of uh, Barrington and Horseshoe Trail, and we got the power back. And, and so, I will tell you that was that was coincidence. I mean, I, I, I mean, I hate to tell you that, but you know, we, and people don't like to hear this, but we don't have any pool with Pico. Uh, there are people at the Chester County. Chester County has an emergency center. There are people there 24 hours a day and been there through this storm. There are Pico people in the next room over from them. So there's constant communication between the county and Pico. We don't have that. So to the extent that you know. Uh, you talk to us and your power gets uh, put up within a short time. 
that's just a, a, a nice, happy circumstance. And, and, and it, it's unfortunate, but that's, that is the chain of command that's been set up. That is the chain of command that we follow. It's not working. And we've told them that. I mean, I will tell you on, on the conference call that we had today with the municipal representatives of PICO, I was the first one to ask questions. I didn't ask questions. I just said, basically, we, we have a horrible situation in West Vincent. We have lots of people without power. At that time, we were 10% of all the people, I think, in Chester County without power. Um, that something had to be done. That they couldn't tell us that they had all these assets and crews it, and we're not seeing them. And that, you know, something had to be done. We've been uh, seeing and, them all day. And, and, you know, there are additional crews in the township uh, to the extent they've heard us. Uh, but I've also heard that some of these crews have been sent out of the township on, on other matters. Uh, you know, they have their own system, they are working their system, uh, and uh, we have some input through like the conference calls, uh, but our primary input is we give Chester County uh, almost hourly, and sometimes much more than hourly updates. Certainly early in the storm, they were getting updates as, as soon as we would know that a road was closed with a tree down, they, the, the county would. How do you feel that we fare compared to Montgomery County? Well, Montgomery County wasn't hit as hard. Yeah. I will say that everything we've heard, and this is from people who've come into the area after the storm, we have more ice on our trees than virtually anywhere. This was almost like ground zero. Uh, yeah. we, we have, and, and of course the problem we have right now is the ice is still on the trees. In a lot of areas, the ice is no longer on the trees. That is certainly not true here. Uh, the storm was really bad to us. We got hurt a lot worse than other people. And I think if the thing I would fault Pico with the most, other than communication, is that I don't think in terms of West Vincent, they've adequately assessed how bad things were. Because, for example, they told me earlier today that they moved certain crews out of the township because they need, they have, on one road in the township, there are 20 to 30 uh, utility poles that need to be replaced. And they didn't have them. Now, they're in the process of getting them and getting them to that area, and, that, and you know, they'll have crews to, to restore them and, and put them in. But they didn't have them. Well, we're how many days into this, and they didn't realize that today that they had that many. But I will say, that, had to, that was also a road. We probably had maybe 50 trees down on it. So maybe. But it's sawmill. No, that's uh, Sheeter Mill. Oh, okay. Uh, Sawmill was nothing but rubbish. Yeah, no, Sheeter Mill was probably the worst place in the township. There were trees everywhere. There were wires everywhere. Uh, one of the thanks that I'll give is to the, the crews that came down from Quebec. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Unbelievable. They have some equipment that puts basically everyone else to shame, and they are dressed for cold weather, and they appear to <laughs> like the cold weather. It's kind of scary. Uh, Thank you. But, uh, you know, they, they have really done a yeoman's job in terms of restoring a lot of power to the township. And they've been in the township since, I believe, Friday. They were probably the first crews into the township other than we did have a hazmat situation during the storm. We did have several uh, utility poles on St. Matt's come down with a transformer in the middle of the road with a spill. So there was a hazmat cleanup during the middle of the storm on St. Matt's. So, We've had situations here that other people haven't had. I think one of the issues, I, you know, for everyone in this room, is that with the exception of some of the developments, people here are on wells. And so, but you know, right now, if you look at where the biggest outages are right now, it's true different, and it's us and Coatesville. Well, Coatesville and different at least have public water, public sewer. Most of the people who are out in West Vincent do not. We've again stressed that to the county. We stressed that to Pico. Um, you know. There are a lot of crews in the township right now. One of the problems we have is that most of the crews only work 16 hour days. So I was just talking with crews before the meeting from Wisconsin. Uh, they are here. Uh, they unfortunately can only work, I believe, till eight or nine o'clock. Uh, and then they have, they'll be, but they'll be back in the morning. Now they've also been told by Pico that they can't leave because there's another storm coming. So just to let you know, I mean, apparently Pico's going to keep a lot of the contractors, a lot of the, um, they're not contractors, uh, help from other utilities here uh, because of the concern with the next storm. Okay. Maria Jacobs is next. You know, I think that um, I, I, too, am very impressed with what we did as a township 
You know, when I saw a backhoe go down our street, I think it was on Wednesday, I was, I was amazed to be like, wow, that's, you know, that's going down. Realizing that our crews also took their lives in their hands because you could still get hit with a tree. Um, so it's this, my comment has nothing to do with what we did. I think from an emergency management standpoint, we did a very good job in managing the situation that was, it, that was impossible to manage. But I do ask that um, we look to do better at informing our residents of our situation. And, you know, a year and a half ago, I signed up for Upper Euclid on their <coughs> website. They just had, you know, if you want to know about emergencies that happen in our township, sign up here. I totally <coughs> forgot that I did that. Um, and so I've never gotten an email from them but I started getting them on a regular basis every two to three hours. And it was really wonderful information to tell me what roads were closed, what, you know, reminding people about, um, you know, where to put a generator, what to do with carbon monoxide, like all the things that you really do need to know. And, in, and I realized that it wouldn't help people if you're dealing with a laptop, but so many people have, um, you know, have iPhones and smartphones that they're getting their emails on their mobile devices that we could do a whole lot better in informing our township of very pertinent, important information, as long as those email addresses are only used for emergency management and no other reason, um, people I think would, be, would gladly give up their email address for that. Um, you know, especially hearing what's going on in the room. We just need to have that kind of good communication in 2014. If you live on top of a hill. Wow. I don't have cell phone coverage in my house, but my phone was able to get emails. Yeah. So and, and, you and get that, and you don't always get. Cell we're phone always coverage. looking for for constructive criticism, and, and, and we thank you for that. Uh, just a couple things to note on that is that certainly on the first day, uh, I know other townships were, were sending out road closures. I think it, for us, it would have been. A mistake to send out road closures on the first day because, for example, on Miller Road, we opened it four times and it closed four times. I mean, it, it was a really bad situation and people should not have been out there. It was well, it was very dangerous. Uh, the other thing about the internet is is I know I've had a lot of complaints from people. There are a lot of people who do have power whose, whose internet is still out. That's another issue. What well, at the height of the storm, about 85 percent to 100 percent of our residents were without power. Uh, I know that weather zone came back on within about five hours, uh, and some of the other subdivisions came on relatively quickly. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a good issue, I think, but one, one of the things we need to look at is, if we're going to do that, I don't think we can do that with, with current staffing. I mean, we're going to have to look at, it, it, you know. Well, it's funny it, because um, as the week went forward, I actually went and compared Upper Euclid's emergency management because that was my thought was, wow, they must have one heck of a staff. And their budget for emergency management is within $7,000 of hours. But emergency management here doesn't put things on the website. It's staff that does. This wasn't on the website. This, this was not on their, I don't know what was on their website. I never right. accessed their website. It was an email that was just right. just sent out. Um, but so you understand that the email is not likely sense. sent by emergency management, it's sent by staff. Possibly. I but don't know what their situation but, is. But topography wise, is is that for you comparable? It, it's about the same size of not. No, I'm talking about dirt roads, trees, uh, all that. The, 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 the all the more reason why we should have that information available because you know what? If it would keep three more people off those roads that, and then trying to have a bad situation, what harm is that? I'm not saying it's a harm, but I don't know if it's, it's comparable. But I know I got an email about uh, from Ken saying to keep everyone off the roads on, on Wednesday. I got that through Chicken Man. I don't know how that happened. but Yeah, you know, it, got, it was... got forwarded without Ken's credit. But anyway, that's where it originally came from. Oh, that's not true. No, it did have Ken's credit. It did have, oh, I didn't see it on mine. Yeah, it yeah the Birch Run Ken. forward, he didn't give Ken credit, but the Chicken Man did. No, I don't, that's Well, hold true. on, hold on. I don't want any credit. I just want people to stay <laughs> off the roads. Let's get that clear. <laughs> Okay? I don't care. I don't care. I shouldn't have put my name on it. I just wanted people to stay off the roads. So, okay. What does the county do with the road closure list? Do they post it? Well, the, 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 the road closure lists are then shared with PICO. Uh, and, and there were some... The, this is a relatively new program that was instituted by PICO last year. 
Uh, I will tell you that there, on the conference call that we had Thursday, PICO was touting that they only had 120 roads closed. And the first participant on the phone call was from Chester County who said, well, I'm just looking at our number ones and number twos. And there's, there's, you could be a one, two, or a three, depending on the, the classification of the road. And they had 275 roads that were closed that were one and twos. At that time, they had a total of 550 roads in Chester County that were closed. So there was a, a real issue of communication between the county and PICO. But PICO uses the information from the county to determine where the roads, they have a separate group that works on road closings. And that's how you get your roads open. Is that's the what county does. doesn't publish that list. Just no, the county does not publish that list. And, and, and there's a lot of information that gets shared, but it's not public information. And there's, prob and there's good reasons that it shouldn't be public information. Another interesting thing is PICO will not tell the county or the townships where the power outages are. Correct. <clears throat> so we don't know where to concentrate our resources. We just start driving the roads and the ones we can get through first we do and we try to get through roads open. If we if we would know that one place is has a hundred percent power outage or fifty and another has ten, we could concentrate on the higher outages, but PICO somehow keeps that as proprietary information for some reason. I don't and know they, what it is. they don't give you a reason why they won't share that? The PICO doesn't give you a reason for any of it. Well, well, I think then we should get hey, from where I stood on the road with a cell phone in my hand, Pico right. was more of a hindrance than a help. For I three think days, then that's so. a call for us to get our politicians in the county to get to Pico and do something about it. Instead of all we're talking about, and again, the township did a great job in getting the roads cleared, uh, wires, safety concerns, but it's reacting to the problem that occurred, and it occurs too frequently. So right. it's That's a right. band-aid to fix the current problem, mm -hmm. and I, I can foresee from what I'm hearing, we're going to be down this road again and again and again and again. It's not attacking the real problem, which is PICO. And I think I'm hearing we need to get politicians involved to do something about it. Did you get the name that John gave you? Because that's the ideal yes, person is. to contact. Yes. He's the perfect guy. Okay. Party. One of the problems we've had here is with the trees. Now, we went through this in 1994. I was out for five days then. That was our last big ice storm. There have been some smaller ones since then, but that was the last big one. If you notice what they use, they subcontract through a company called Asplin. You've seen their orange and white trucks running around. I think Pico owns Asplin. I don't know. I understood they were an independent contractor, but I'm not sure on that. The trucks that they're using are basically high rangers. They'll reach 70 feet. Now, once you're over 70 feet, I suppose the limbs that are above that, on that side of the road, defy gravity because they don't go up any higher than that. They'll trim them out to the top, but you look up above there and they're all hanging out over the roots. That's where their problem is. If they would trim the right-of-ways properly, and they have the 13 and a half feet from the side of the road, they also have the, the buckets that will reach it because when they, that tree that we had at my house up there it was a 90-foot tree. They came out there with an aspen bucket took it back and came out there with a reach haul, which is what, 90 feet? And they have them to go higher than that. So maybe what they're doing when they're trimming the trees, if they would do it correctly, and that's right straight up, all the way over the wires, we wouldn't have near as many branches, tree branches, large obstacles coming down. You load those with ice, and the old formula, F equals MA, by the time that thing comes down 20 feet, it's got a heck of a force behind it. Plus, a lot of the distribution that they have out here, the distribution <coughs> of my road is number four copper, which is REA, area 1940. It's still up there. Now, maybe they should improve a little of that. They did with their 33, because they couldn't put 33 over the wire. But a lot of the other places, they have not. Their distribution needs work. Now, how you're going to get them to do it, I don't know. Well, I, and you can't get your distribution anywhere else. You can get your electric, but you cannot get the distribution. They have it. So you have to get to them somehow. And I don't know how that is. Well, I had a heck of a time trying to get that tree up there that Ken knows about at my house taken down. And that would have come down now. Actually, I thought about that the other day. I'm glad you took those trees down because we didn't have to deal with them. Right. So they would have come down. One of the questions in today's conference call was exactly that. What, what can be done? What is being done? 
Uh, one of the things Pico said is that one of the things they're looking at right now, and apparently they're using it in some locations, is there's a, a new wire which is um, stronger, has much higher tensile strength, so it, 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 it will react better in storms to at least the smaller branches than the copper and, and, uh, and other uh, uh, conductors that they have up there. I think one of the problems that we have, though, is that you know we, we have whole trees that came down, and there's not much that you know, is going to withstand that. Although I've seen you know, the, the primary that came down on my road, I was shocked. There was a 100-foot tree that, that hit the primary. And it, it didn't break it, but it took it most of the way to the ground. The only problem is you also still have other forms of distribution, CCMS, armored primary, there's a number of them out there. But PICO has found those to be too expensive. Instead of laying them out in an arm, put some CCMS up there so you've got a, a bundle of wire to deal with. John Rear is next, if you're finished already. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. John Rear. Yeah, I, I just want to recognize that we're in a rural township. We enjoy the, na the nature of the, of the township. We enjoy our, our, our trees. Uh, there's a balance to be struck between uh, too much trimming and not enough trimming. And you see sometimes aspen will go down and they will butcher trees. That's one point. Uh, the second point is that there's always going to be another storm coming along. And sooner or later, a worse storm is going to come along. And I think whether it be Pico, the township, the county, there's only so much that can be done at the government level. Uh, in a crisis situation, could we, use, while all this is fresh in our minds, use uh, Community Day to get the word out about preparedness at, at the uh, household level? You know, that's a good idea. Or neighborhood association? Yeah. John, you want to be on the table? <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> so you want to be on the table? <laughs> At community day? I'll be there on many tables. Okay. okay. Uh, Brian Carter, just thanks. I wasn't out here in Chester County, but I was in Delaware County in 1958 when snowdrop occurred. And that was what? a... When what occurred? Snowdrop. Snow and it drop. was a heavy, wet snow in March. <coughs> and it took we conductors... Didn't know it, it took conductors down like crazy. And as a result of that, after that, the electric company sized the wires, the distribution system, for the snow loads, not the current loads. And it's one thing that I noticed. I'm out in California, and I'm looking at the wires up there, and there's these little tiny things. So we didn't have the wires drop due to ice. We dropped them due to trees, which does go and change things around a little bit. And I'm not sure whether you can go and size wires to support trees, and even then you still have problems with it. So. Did you say 1958? 1958. Yeah. Oh my God. That was, was the they said this was the second biggest Pico event in the first one. No, it's, they, they've, they've they've changed decided. that. This is now the, this is the biggest event. I, I thought they so were up. Pardon? Before or after 58? No, this, this is the biggest event for Pico. That's what they've been saying. Yeah, no, yeah, was 1958, right. 1958, they only took out 400,000 customers at that time. Yeah. Yeah. That was everybody that was in the five county area. Yeah. 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 This, this, this time, was over 700,000 customers are without power. Our population was much smaller then. Yes. Uh, Harriet. Um, I, going on what John was suggesting about doing things on a more individual level. Could the township keep track of the fact that Harriet's got two extra bedrooms and a generator, so if somebody doesn't have a place, a warm place, they could just come trot up and knock on the door and... What's for breakfast tomorrow? <laughs> I, it's probably going to be cold cereal, but I've got lots of nice fresh uh, food for it. <laughs> um, I had a guest over the weekend because one of our darling policemen knocked on my door and said, can you take her in? And I he said, sure. And we go, but... Jim, is that something that's doable? I, I think there's... 
I think there's a place for just individuals to. I think it's a great idea because you never know who needs. It. We also took somebody in for a couple of days. Yeah. And, and, and there's been a lot of people in Weatherstone, which had, which was only out for five hours. Where but if we it's my understanding that there's, there's, there's a lot of people living in Weatherstone right now. So how do we start that? Well, for one thing, if he knows there's 400 people out right now, he can give me. No, no, I mean getting him into the, you know. Some kind of registry calling in Jim. Jim, Jim you want to sleep over tonight? <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you know, it's, it, it's interesting. One of the things that we've noticed through, through this whole storm is, of course, a lot of people. It's it's extremely difficult to get people to leave their houses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and a lot of that, you know, we have a number of horse farms out here. We have people who who have to be close to their animals because they're taking care of them. Uh, we have. A, a lot of people, and, and I know this has been an issue for us, it's been an issue for the police, contacting people, trying to get people to safe and warm locations, and, and we've had people refuse. Uh, part of that is people just want to stay. My biggest concern, and the concern we've had all day with, with PICO, and why we've been pushing hard to get things finished, is that you know it's going to go down to zero tonight. And while it's been cold, it has not been as cold. So our concern is, you know, just making sure that people are safe. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a good idea what you suggested. And it's certainly something we can look into. And, and she's right by the road, because like I got the room, but the impossible driveway. So. Do we know where the, where the power's out, though? We do, right now, we don't. I mean, that's, that, that's one of the problems. Is so people for us to reach out to people. It is. It is very difficult for us to reach out to people. We, on the other hand, you know, we were operational every single day. We had uh, lots of phone calls. We had staff here to take phone calls. Um, you know, we, we, we attempted to address a lot of stuff. That a lot of calls came into the police uh, directly, and, and they've been working with people directly. So you, know, you, you do what you can in the emergencies. Hey, Francis. Um, I, what, I, I think the crews that came down here worked very hard. <coughs> made a mistake. They should have been honest in the very beginning and said, look, uh, this is bad, really bad, and you should be prepared to be without electric for seven days. With that, we, we could have managed. You could have gone, gone out and gotten water or extra food, um, but they never did that. It, they would, with the radio that we were list, listening to, they would, they would give a number of outages. You know, it, it, uh, and that, that, that was no deal help to us. Um, but, you know, come on, guys, just fess up. The, you know, there's, something's really bad here. It, it, you may be out for seven days if, you're, if you have power back in one day, then thank God. If not, you know, you have water. Francis, you know, a lot of people I, th I think Jim addressed that. I think what he, what, he, what he indicated was that Pico knew there was a lot of power outages. They just didn't realize that it was a war zone with all the trees down, which had to be addressed first. Because maybe they didn't live here. Who, who knows why? But that's something that's after the fact it was addressed, but they, you know, they Yeah, I mean, they didn't get assessment teams out to our township really until Friday. Uh, I mean, the storm was so bad, they, they did not get assessment teams out on, on Wednesday. And, and, you know, during the height of things, and, and obviously there's certain information that's not public, but there were hospitals without power, sewer plants without power, nursing homes without power, you know, the number of intersections that were blocked. Uh, we had trees come down in this town. We have two. We have two. Count them. Two traffic signals in the township. One of which was completely destroyed by two trees, which hit it at two different times on Route 401. Uh, you know, it, it was an extraordinary situation. There were lots of things out. What Pico and the county was doing was basically triage. I mean, they were going to do things. They had uh, critical customers. They had critical infrastructure that they needed to get out. Uh, they had the closed roads to get out. One of their other priorities was the schools. I mean, they made it a priority such that all the schools were open today. Now, that doesn't mean that the school buses could get to all the kids to get them to school, but, but all the schools were open today. So, you know, they've done a lot. I don't think they, quite frankly, knew the magnitude of some of the damage in West Vincent until today. But that's, a, that's an issue of, I don't think they could get to some of the areas that were, were, that were so severely damaged until today. And again, they've been bringing uh, crews and assets in from all throughout the com country. Uh, you know, we have crews in the area from Georgia, uh, Wisconsin, Quebec, 
uh, all throughout New York State. PPNL and MedEd have sent crews in. Illinois has crews in. There's there's crews from uh, Baltimore Gas and Electric has crews in. Um, Pico has one of the things they did, which I know they were criticized for, was Sandy's. They brought a tremendous amount of crews in in a really short period of time. Um, and and you know they've made a lot of strides in getting a lot of work done. Um, but it's you know it, it's been a pretty massive undertaking. Okay, Suzanne Roll. Um, building on what Harriet said, it would be interesting if we could have a group of people within the township evaluate who has generators in the <coughs> space. Who are the people who are living alone down long lanes? Um, do they heat with wood? What's their situation? I mean, there were certainly. Can you were where we live, and there were a lot of trees down, and we couldn't get to many of the places. You, you could walk a half a block, and that was it, or maybe one block. So <clears throat> I, I, I'm thinking that maybe it's time that we did some kind of a confidential, I don't know how one does this, but an evaluation of the township of those people who live alone and are vulnerable, um, and someone <coughs> who, I mean, we had no telephone, nothing. And I'm sure a lot of people were like this. And one of our neighbors <clears throat> was by herself, heats with wood, was all there down her little long lane, um, and we didn't really know it. And so, it, it, even though the neighbors are concerned, I don't know who could have gotten there, but maybe somebody could have. I, and I don't have the answers, I'm just sort of speculating that I think particularly people who are vulnerable, who live by themselves, it, we need to sort of have a you raise a good point, and, and one thing I'll point out is one of the things that our police department has been doing is because we get calls from neighbors, and they, they, people have been asking our police to check out and make sure that their neighbors are safe and okay. And they've been, and that's one of the things that they've been doing, and they've been doing it throughout this entire period. And one of the key things that you mentioned is neighbors. I mean, neighbors are are great, and and if you have a concern about somebody. Just, just call our police department. They're happy to, to check it but out. We and we can even call you. That's what I'm saying. Right. Uh, so what I'm saying is, if it would be phone. interesting if we had no cell phones or no from my house. No. Yeah, yeah, we're down in the valley. What I'm saying is that I think if we had a list of vulnerable people within the township, it's not that neighbors wouldn't help. It's just that having that vulnerable list, you could maybe the township could contact a neighbor if they had phone service. Could you walk in? I mean, I know people have walked into other people's properties to see if they were safe, et cetera, et cetera. And is there any way we can keep the teenagers off the road? Oh, my God. <laughs> this is up to you. Yeah. Oh, I was just with, going back to, to what John and everybody's saying. I'm wondering if we could utilize uh, neighborhood associations more. I know Weatherstone has one. Uh, we have the Bertrand Film has one. And if if we could kind of encourage the neighborhood associations so that with it, it, instead of doing a township who has generators, who has this, if we reduced it to neighborhoods so that you really know. I mean, I know when this happened, we knew people who had pets that needed attending and they were out of town. And, you know, um, the people who probably had a generator maybe needed help or, you know, things like that. So it, it wasn't perfect, but perhaps if we kind of concentrate on encouraging our neighborhood associations so that they have the wherewithal or, you know, at least the knowledge of who perhaps might be in need in the next next storm and, and, and just to let you know we have been in contact with the neighborhood associations uh, throughout the storm uh, they've been very good in terms of keeping eyes on their neighborhood and, and determining what what is happening in their neighborhood and they've been very good in terms of sharing information with us okay is that all Ms. Elgina? no no I mean that's that's fine I mean the only thing I remember getting uh, from our neighborhood association is uh, Sarah's thing asking if we would put out 
the, the list of road closings and, mm -hmm. and stuff, which we did. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I, I don't remember anything else to me. Okay. okay. Uh, John, where are next? Yeah, just going to Suzanne's suggestion here. Doesn't Limerick uh, maintain a supposedly maintain a list of people? Uh, yes, and, and Jim, Jim Gooden can answer that. I mean, Jim, Jim has a list. We do not have a list. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it may be outdated. It may be outdated. It gets outdated, outdated. All, all the time. And, right. and, and PICO sends out materials at least once a year. And is that information available to the township? That's yeah, Jim, Jim Gooden has it, yes. And the answer is yes, we have that. Right. Brian Carth. Well, I was going to go in the same direction, that it would seem that what Suzanne is talking about would link up with the information that uh, PICO gets or whoever gets for Limerick. And it, I'm going to say build onto it because I think there's some unique aspects for a storm like we've had now, which is different than a radiological emergency that Limerick would generate. But it would seem that the two could be used together or build on it or something like that. Yeah, they, they have the special needs registry, PA.org. You can go on. You can register yourself or a neighbor, and I get that information also. And actually, that's probably the best mechanism for special needs residents. Because it has quite a long questionnaire, it's a lot of questions like that. So as far as do you have a generator, do you have pets, can you drive, do you need transportation, things like that. And whenever someone signs up for that, I automatically get an email to tell me I have someone new that signed up. Maintain that list. And, and, and I know that through, through the storm, Jim has been in contact with a number of the group home, and they have been contacting us to let it know that they do have special needs and special issues. And I know they, you know, Jim's been working to address those. And, and I'm going to address this to Jim. And suppose like, does it sounds like that's a needs list as opposed to a resource list, which maybe is what somebody was talking about. Or Harry was saying, people with resources as opposed to the special needs. That would be nice to uh, A develop. blending yeah. of the two somehow that could work yeah, there. I'd, I'd like to work on something like that, resource, local resources. Okay. Any other comments on the storm event? Thank you all. Thank you for everything you did. You know, Suzanne, the other day when I stopped, was talking to you and Sue Crew because the where it was blocked. I referred to it as community building. Yes, place. you did. I hope you didn't think that I was making fun of the no, serious no, no, situation. No, no, so. no, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. Um, you know, one of the things that's best about West Vincent is under these circumstances, um, we shine as best we can. You know, our neighbors, our government officials all come out and do their very best. Mm -hmm. And it's just a frustration because of our location and the way we were hit by the storm, there were just things that you couldn't do. Um, and as I said, if we could train all the parents who have teenagers who have driver's license to take the keys away or something during events like this, it would be enormously helpful. Schoolhouse Lane was, was those seven trucks at the, you know, on Schoolhouse Lane at that intersection. We had more cars going up and down that road, even though there were cones that said, Clearly, don't come up here. People still came, and the teenagers were unbelievable. I mean, I stood in the middle of the road and went, oh, guys, you know, there's, and they'd sort of zip back, and then they'd zip down another road. Um, I know you can't teach common sense, and I'm an old fogey, so it really bothers me a lot. But anyway, thank you all. Okay, are there any other comments on any other items other than the storm? Okay. Uh, need to approve the minutes. Ken. Oh, Brian. Sorry. It, 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 I'm going to go and ask only one question. It's kind of related to the storm. Is at the last meeting I asked whether we had any idea of how much we had spent on snow removal last year <laughs> and what we had gone to this year approximately. In snow last year. <laughs> you want me to read this? Or you want a copy of it? Well, I'd like you to read it, please. Cost for the winter. And this is just this isn't just snow removal. This is contractor materials, overtime, you know, salt, all that stuff. 2012-2013, we spent fifty-one thousand eight hundred twenty-seven dollars and seventy-seven cents. 
until the end of until January 29th of 2014. <coughs> 2013-14, where we spent sixty thousand three twenty-two and fifty-nine cents. Thank you. And then it snowed, and then it snowed, and now it's going okay. to snow again. It was last year, like winter snow yes. last year. Yeah. Very nice. There was no snow last year. Actually, we. We had a couple. Well, there was some snow. Nothing compared to this year. Yeah, we plowed snow on the 25th of March in 2013. It's relative. So it was a long time to go yet. Yeah. <laughs> and and one you. of the things with last year is, is there were a number of small snow events, too small to, to, to plow, but you guys still have to do the salt in, in the end. Okay. So one of the things you'll see is some years where there is truly no snow, we won't use a lot of materials, but some years when we have lots of small snows, use an awful lot of material because it, it, it gets very slippery. And of course with the topography we have, you know, the, you just need to, to get things out and make it safe for people. Okay, other comments? Yeah, um, two things. One, I think the township should make sure that they keep their focus on in terms of getting cleaned up, access, all of those kinds of things. Now, a lot of these peripheral things are things that would be better done by people who have a heart to do it. I don't think the township should be in the business of putting people in other people's homes. And you know, with the internet, that's something if somebody has a heart to do it, they can do that. But you, know, you need to keep your focus on getting roads cleared, safety, public access, those types of things. Uh, my other question is, at the end of the day, does every resident own their trees out to the road line? Until there's a problem with them, then they belong to the township. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, that's my question. No, know, that's my answer. That's exactly how it is. People will be good stewards of their land. Yeah. Should they be maintained? People have said tonight the trees need to be trimmed more aggressively when we're trimming trees during the summer and Pico's trimming trees. We catch more hell from residents about trimming trees than any other single thing we do. So, and we still have an ongoing tree. In fact, Chicken Man made a big thing last summer about we spent $6,000 taking down one tree. Actually, it was two days of tree removal. but. You know, it's like a big joke to people is, why do you need to trim this tree? You know, it looks fine to me. So. But at the end of the day, the residents own their trees out to the, out to the road line. Yeah, they're not responsible for damage that they cause right. because the township cleans it up. But, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Suzanne? Um, can we make sure that particularly PICO listens to township residents when they ask for the trees to be dealt with? Yeah. I'm sorry, in terms of making PICO listen, <laughs> there's, yeah. People listen well, to if, if people to listen. pay more attention. We, we have we have talked to people and, and that's all I'm saying. We can okay. communicate with people. We will communicate with people. Thank one you. of the things that's on our agenda is when this is all over, we have asked uh, one to have input into into Pico's um, uh, review of the situation, what they can do better, uh, and and what we need. Uh, we have also asked for a specific sit down with Pico about the closure of Route 100. Okay, so comments? Marty. The only thing you owning trees to the side of the road, you have a utility right away, 16 and a half feet from the center line of that road. We don't have a utility right away, but public access. Public right access, way. but the utility companies have the right of way. If they want to come down here, 16 and a half feet from the center of the road. So if they feel like coming down here and take a tree out, you can disagree with it, but they're going to take it down, or trim it, or do what they have to do with it. Good. Any other comments? <coughs> okay. I need a motion to approve the minutes of the January 27th supervisor's meeting. I'll make that motion that we approve the minutes from January 27th, 2014. Second. Any comment? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Jim, manager's report. Uh, I, I must apologize. There is no formal manager's report because I didn't get to it. Um, there were other things that we were pressing. I apologize for that. Uh, you know, it, it, it's the last week has been difficult uh, for the township personnel, uh, but I think they've really stepped up their game and done a lot of things to assist the residents. Uh, but, you know, that's what we do. That's going to continue to be done. Uh, and I just want to thank everybody who's, who's contributed and, and helped out. Um, tomorrow night, North and Fifth. And Sarah reminds me tomorrow night there is a Northern Federation meeting uh, at uh, Warwick Township Building at 7, 7 p.m. And the program <coughs> is Rain Gardens as Stormwater Management. Thank you. Okay, active subdivision list. Uh, we have a list. What's next? 
Um, I'm at the subdivision list. Uh, we have an extension request for the Bachelor subdivision, which is a property that's accessed through Ivy Lane off of First Street Trail. They're asking for an extension. Uh, asking us to grant them an extension for nine, uh, 94 days. And they don't have a date when that ends. Do you know when that is? I figure that out. Okay. They're asking for a 90 day extension May. for the subdivision. May. I'm May 11th. Application is for May 11th. So your motion to uh, grant that. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Second. There's a uh, guy named Frank Bachelor owns a piece of property on, it's not on Horseshoe Trail, it's accessed through Ivy Lane 2 Horse Trail, backs off the St. Stephen Street. Uh, he has a lot, he wants to divide into two lots, is that right? That's correct, he has, he has seven plus acres, acres. he wants to, to divide it into two lots. Right. And that's his and he's asking thing. for variances? No. I'm not sure. He's not, he's not asking for a variance now. Or no. Officially. He's filed a subdivision application with the township. Under the municipality's planning code, we have 90 days to make a decision on that application unless it's otherwise extended. And what he's asked, what he's granted the township is a 90-day extension of the original 90 days. So that's all that this is tonight. It's, okay. it's simply... Uh, something the township must do because if the township day doesn't do it, it becomes a deemed yes. approval. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay, motion was made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, bill's list is next. Uh, for February 10th, 2014, the general fund bill's list is $92,016.04 for the reimbursable bill's list. $15,601.05. The subdivision utility plant bills list is $18,793.53. For a total of $126,410.62. Uh, invoices to be ratified are one for $25,6904 and one for $530, which are included in the regular bills list. Uh, there's your motion for approval. So moved. I'll second it. Uh, Tom Josiah Consulting, $2,040. Now, is that a one-time payment, or is that no. a... He provides assistance to our treasurer uh, throughout the year, uh, which he's an ex-auditor. He used to work for our audit company, he used to work for Barbican and Thornton. And he provides assistance, particularly at the end of the year, uh, in uh, helping to prepare the DCED report, which needs to be filed with the state, and making sure that um, all of our financials meet the audit requirements. All right, is this a set fee or is it by? It's by hour. By hour. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and he's been doing it for several years. Thank you, Jim. Okay, Brian, I saw you have your hand up. Um, we got a number of questions here. The, it, in the, it's good that uh, Jim is here. He may be able to go and fly some color on this. I noticed emergency management got two desktop computers. I'm surprised they didn't get like a laptop for you know portability. Is there some reason why we went for desktop units there? Uh, the laptop, I think, is next, right, Jim? Yes, the laptop is, a, is a, also in the works. All I'm seeing is it says two desktop computers. That's correct. That's this bill list is only for the desktop. Okay. Hey, another, another question, Brian? Yes. Uh, Kimberton Boat Road Review on Carroll Engineering. What was that work being done? For a, uh, what's, is that a conditional use application for a property or? Yes. On Kimberton Road, we review the application. Okay. Uh, the 2220 <coughs> Flowing Springs Road plan legal description. Is it 2220 or is it 2200? It's 2200. Okay, so that was for the, um, the schoolhouse, correct? Well, wow, for the property that's adjacent to the school, to the one where the school is. Got it. Um, let's see. We've got a furnish and install video equipment from Integrations Incorporated. Um, what is that? Uh, that is equipment uh, from, there's, there's several things in there, but the, the primary thing in there is uh, when emergency management had its uh, exercise for Limerick last year, one of the things Chester County wanted uh, was uh, that they have the ability to, since they're upstairs in, in what we call the old building, the 
23 old house. Uh, they wanted the, them to have the ability to see people uh, at both uh, building doors. So that's to install the cameras and the equipment so that they could view uh, both of those doors. But these are like doors inside the building or so that they know exterior, coming exterior in? for people coming in. Okay. Road grader thermostat was eight hundred and fifty-six dollars. Yep. And is it custom in some way or shape? Yeah, it's custom. We buy it from John Deere, and the guy comes and installs it. It's four hundred twenty-five dollars for the road trip for the mechanic. Three hundred fifty-two dollars labor, about a hundred bucks for the thermostat. So this is something that uh, our own road crew is not able to go. They would have been able to do, but we were up against time frame. We had to get it done. We had everybody out of the trucks. We had to get the grader fixed. What, do we have some work that we were using it for? What? The road grader? Yeah, we plow snow with it. We plow snow with it. Okay. That's it. Thank you, Betty. Okay. Maria. My question goes back to the, um, the video surveillance, and I'm confused by your answer. Um, so you said something about Limerick suggesting that we have... No, Chester County. There, there was an, an annual exercise that we participate in. Uh, which is, I guess this year was a uh, simulated uh, terror attack on the Limerick nuclear power plant. And we go through an exercise with Chester County. Uh, there, there's also, uh, I believe, state people here who uh, make sure that uh, we're in compliance with certain requirements in that exercise. And one of the things that, that Chester County uh, noted that we didn't have that they wanted corrected was they wanted uh, the emergency management to have uh, the ability to view <coughs> remotely uh, both entrances to the building. It just seems kind of random to me that um, Chester County's emergency management is concerned about the entrances to our building and the, it was it a requirement? I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree it? with that. It's something that, that they noted as a deficiency. So we went and corrected it. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but uh, the requirements before were that there was a policeman or a guard uh, posted at the entrance to the emergency management room before. Yes. And with the cameras, we don't have to do that. It doesn't have to be an actual person. How many? Uh, I'm just, you know, emergency management, I'm glad that you're here because at least now I can see, well, there is a person because uh, we've heard about it a whole lot over the years, but I don't understand, you know, what the role is. Um, I mean, now obviously after this week, you have a little bit better idea, but um, I still don't really. And and then is it one person? And we bought a laptop. Just um, we paid for a laptop for emergency management like two meetings ago, and now there's two desktops. And you say another laptop. How many people are in emergency management? That is a John just wanted to know if that's a builds list question. I thought I'd forward that to you. It is a builds question because that's where I was coming to next was the desktop. Okay. Thank you, John. <laughs> you might stay with you tonight, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> he makes the coffee, Harry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I make pretty good coffee. He'll, he'll be okay. So my question goes to the bills list. Thank you. Um, and emergency management. How many people are in our emergency management? Well, the answer to that is 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 that it depends. Uh, Emergency management, it, it, Jim Gooding is our emergency management coordinator. Uh, Kevin Freeze also is, uh, works for them. On the other hand, there is a whole series of volunteers. We have a group of people who, who do the ham radio. Uh, I think when we have the Limerick exercise, we have probably, what, a dozen people involved in the exercise? Fifteen. Uh, or 50, yeah, as many as 15 people involved in the exercise. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a requirement being in the evacuation zone from Limerick. In terms of what Jim does, I mean, we have an emergency, we have an emergency plan, which we've had for years. He updates that, makes sure that it's current. Uh, he's involved in, I mean, whenever there's a hurricane or an ice storm or a major snowstorm, I mean, emergency management is involved in all of these things. There's a, a huge amount of work that goes on behind the scenes, but there's a lot of coordination that is done with Chester County, which has its own emergency operations department. 
And one of the things that the emergency managers and the, and the other people do is they coordinate with the county and, and other people uh, you know, whenever there are emergencies and in advance of the emergencies. There's a lot of training involved. Uh, Jim, I know, has gotten a lot of certifications uh, so that he can do the work. Uh, it is something that is, is a very valuable uh, asset to the community. And you're right, it's something that for the most part appears behind the scenes until you have a nice storm like this. One other thing, on Friday we happened to have a, an executive session in the meeting room and, and Jim had a meeting upstairs and there were police officers up and down those stairs all night long, you know, because you know, they're an integral part of it. And I never saw that and you'd never seen it, but it, it just happens. <coughs> it's more than you and I think. Other questions about the bills list? Brian, right. correct. Is the, um, the the video system that is, shows up on the bills list associated with the new uh, signs out in the parking lot that says that uh, you're under video surveillance out there? Uh, yes, because when you have uh, uh, cameras that view out of the building, we thought there was a notification requirement, which is why we don't have signs in the parking lot. Okay. Thank you. Other bills list questions? Motions to make and second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. From the correspondence, we have a request to use the meeting room from Pam Tullis for the 4-H on Sunday, <coughs> March 2nd. Sunday, March 2nd, and Sunday, March 9th, from 1 to 3 p.m., the large meeting room. No conflict on that? Yep. You want to make a sure, I'll make that motion that we approve that request. Second. Any comment? Those in favor? Aye. 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 For the new business, we have the amphibian migration. Harriet, you get to introduce that to the people that are familiar with. Okay, we microphone. What? Microphone. Microphone. <coughs> sure, Brian. Can you hear you? Once again, we are going to try to, if the supervisors give us permission, we are going to try to protect the amphibian migration on Hollow Road. Uh, last year, we didn't really. Well, we protected a lot of toads one night. We didn't have so many frogs. I think it was because we had a couple nights where there were big storms in the middle of the night, and we pretty much give up by 9 or 9.30, because that's until everybody else is home and in bed. So what I'm doing tonight is asking for permission of the supervisors that I can work with Mike Swininger to have Hollow Road <coughs> closed for roughly two or two and a half hours, maybe as many as four nights in this coming spring, because I'm sure we're going to have spring, guys. <laughs> this is the, the frogs need it. Um, so, so that we can, we will put up some signs that say frog migration coming, and then when we, we really are pretty convinced, though we're not frog mind readers, uh, we will put out signs that say road closed tonight for the frog migration. You also had to shorten one because it turned into a <coughs> thunderstorm, so you had to get people we, home. We, when, there's not going to be so much damage probably to frogs in the middle of a major storm, but we did not want to have people out on the roads then, so we just sent everybody home. So, and anyone who wants to help with this, talk to me after the meeting and I'll put you on my email list and we have let me tell you, the frogs only migrate when it's dark, it's raining, and the temperature is above about 36 degrees. In other words, horrible weather. And people are standing out there helping these frogs get across the road, protecting them from neighbors who either don't believe the road closed sign or who have to get to their homes. And everybody's got a grin on their face like you can't believe it because it's such fun to protect these little guys as they're going over to breed from where they've been they've hibernating all winter long. Anyway, so would you please consider letting me deal with Mike Swininger and play with the frogs this year? I would move that Harry be authorized to <coughs> deal with the police chief or the police department as necessary for this purpose. Thank you very much. Oh, You're going to have to second that one, Kat. <laughs> I'm to you. Okay, motion being seconded. Any comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, under, John, new business, you want her? <coughs> under new business, we have a new zoning hearing application for 1825 Kimberton Road, uh, requesting relief from setbacks. 
says it, it's a 55 acre property. Uh, the uh, equitable owner is Barbara Berry. The equitable <coughs> owner is a company called Glenlin LLC, which is supplied for the uh, zoning uh, consideration. Legal owner is Barbara Berry. Uh, they wish to improve the property by construction of a horse walker, hay, equipment barn, manure storage area, lighting, and an outdoor training track and cow uh, in pursuit of a commercial equestrian operation. So, we do see there just acknowledge acceptance of this? Um, I don't think we need to do anything. This is just public notice that, that we received this because this is a zoning hearing okay. application which needs to go to the zoning hearing board for them okay. to set up a hearing uh, on it. Okay. Okay, and the last thing on the new business decision on the agenda, we need to ratify the emergency uh, declaration that we did on Wednesday. Wednesday, is that right? Yes. So what would that motion say? Steve, do you have any? Just a, a, a motion to ratify the action of the Board of Supervisors declaring a state of emergency uh, due to the storm. Okay, and also the township's still okay. under that state of emergency as of well. Yeah, so. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Comment? Well, Brian. Do we go and uh, undeclare it at some time in the future, or yes. does it just sit there? No, we won't declare it. Seven, eight, five, period. Thank you. Other comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 Second.